as Dr. Robertson used to say, at my age, it's a joy for me to be any place. <laughs> but uh, it's good. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, come and share the Word of God with you. Uh, as I get a little bit older along in life, I've heard that uh, when you get a little bit of age on you, your memory doesn't work quite as well as it used to. Uh, have some of you discovered that yet? Uh, you uh, go into another room uh, to get something, and before you get there, you forget what you're going after. Uh, it's just uh, kind of an aggravation. I heard about an older couple one time, and uh, they squabbled all the time about which one had the poor memory. Uh, the, my, the lady insisted that, uh, that the husband did, and the husband insisted that she did. So they were sitting one night watching television, and uh, the wife said, uh, Honey, would you uh, mind getting me a dish of ice cream? Well, said, No, I'll be glad to do that. So uh, he got up and started in the kitchen, and she said, Now, wait a minute, Henry. She said, You know, get your pad now and write it down, because you know you'll forget it before you get in there. Ah, he said, uh, uh, You just uh, hush up. said, I'll get your ice cream. She said, well, if you don't mind while you're in there, uh, would you put a little chocolate syrup on top of it? Well, yes, he said, I'll do that. But she said, now, Henry, you know you can't remember two things, so get your pad and write it down. He said, I'll show you whether or not I can. She said, well, if you can remember two, she said, uh, could you remember to put a little whipped cream on top of it and make, make a little sundae? <laughs> yes, he said, I'll do that. And again, she said, now, Henry, get your pad. He ignored her. She said, now, one more thing, Henry. She said, while you're in there, if you'll put a cherry on top of my Sunday, I'd appreciate it. He said, I'll be glad to do that. So he left and went to the kitchen, and he stayed a good while, and he came back carrying a platter of eggs and bacon. <laughs> she looked at him, and she said, Henry, I told you that you would forget something and yeah, I told you to write it down, and sure enough, you forgot to bring my toast. <laughs> well, I don't know whether that's a true story or not. <laughs> Turn in your Bible tonight, if you will, to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 6. The title of our message tonight is Priceless Lessons That We Learn From a Trying Experience. Priceless Lessons Learned from a Trying Experience. Mark chapter 6, if you will, and we'll begin reading with verse 35. I'll read a rather lengthy portion here. Mark chapter 6, and we'll begin reading with verse 35. The Bible says, And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, literally deserted. We'll read about the green grass in just a moment. Literally, this is a deserted place, and now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about, into the villages, and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. They say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread, give them to eat? He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. Incidentally, those loaves were what we'd call a little flat pancake. So he said unto them, How many loaves have you? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. He commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven blessed and break the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before them and the two fishes divided he among them all and they did all eat and were filled and they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes and they that did eat of the loaves were about five thousand men notice it specifies men no doubt there were many women with them perhaps as many women as men plus no doubt some children so there could have been as many as 12 or 15,000 of these people in this uh, uh, situation. Verse 45, <clears throat> Straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the, into the ship and go to the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent the people away. 
And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. About the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. For they all saw him, and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. He went up unto them into the ship, the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, as we open your word tonight, I pray the Holy Spirit of God will open our hearts and our minds, help us to uh, glean truth, help us to be blessed, help us to learn these uh, three spiritual lessons that will be such a blessing to us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This event took place uh, there on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, probably about a year before Jesus was crucified. I believe that he died in A.D. 30, and this would take place probably about the spring of A.D. 29. <clears throat> this was known as the year of popularity. His uh, ministry normally divided into about three different years, three and a half. The first year, uh, he, he was preaching mostly to the individuals. Uh, the second year, uh, he was preaching to the great crowds, and that was during this time. The third year was the year uh, of, uh, of opposition when the people were turning against him. So probably about a year before he was crucified, this took place. Now, notice again, if you will, the setting when this took place, and especially that night. Uh, that's what we're going to, to focus on, the uh, event that took place that night. It was right after the feeding of perhaps 15,000 people with those... Uh, uh, five little pancakes and two little fishes, which was a tremendous miracle. The purpose of Jesus' miracles, uh, he always, as you know, had a purpose. He never worked those miracles, never performed them just to entertain. Right. There were three main purposes for his miracles. The first one was to supply a need, and that was the situation here. The, I think the primary purpose of at least most of them was to prove to people who he was, to prove his deity, that he truly is the Son of God, and that he is able to meet every situation that we, uh, that we ever encounter. Uh, of course, the purpose of showing people, proving that he is the Son of God, was to encourage them to believe on him and be saved. You may remember a verse in John chapter 20. Uh, John said many other miracles, signs, are not uh, that Jesus did are not recorded in this book. But these are recorded that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing have life through His name. Amen. So the primary purpose, I believe, of all of them was to convince people of who He was, authenticate His message, and encourage people to be saved. Then also another uh, reason for those miracles he was training these apostles for their future ministry. Uh, he was obviously going to go back to heaven, and they were going to carry on the ministry. And these men had to, had to learn and had to understand that Jesus is sufficient for every situation that they would ever face. Now, the interesting part is, they didn't, the, the feeding of the 5,000 just didn't impress them. Look at your Bible again, and verse uh, 50. 51. Notice verse 51 again. He went up in, uh, unto them in the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. Well, if they had paid attention to the feeding of the 5,000, they wouldn't have been so astounded at the stilling of the storm. The feeding of those 5,000 was just as much a miracle as stilling the storm. Then notice verse 52 again. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. They even participated in that miracle of feeding those 15,000 people. They handed out the bread, and they saw Jesus multiply 
Can you imagine? Can you picture that? Five little pancakes and two small fish. And Jesus began to multiply that and multiply it and multiply it and baskets full and multiply it. That was a tremendous miracle. For some strange reason, they just didn't get it. It didn't impress them. So I think what Jesus did here, he had to employ a different method. He had to teach these men that truly he is sufficient. Amen. They paid no attention to that first miracle, so uh, he used another method. Now, let's notice, if we will, in the time that we have, the three lessons, spiritual lessons that we can learn from their experience. Notice with me, if you will, in verse 45, Jesus sent them into that storm. Look at verse 45 again. The Bible says, And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go to the other side. He constrained them. That same word is translated in Acts 26 verse 11 by the word compel. He compelled them to go. Those men were professional fishermen. They had been raised there on the Sea of Galilee. And they understood the weather conditions. From uh, the Sea of Galilee east, there are hundreds of miles of desert. In the evening, the Sea of Galilee is subject to those sudden severe storms. And those men knew that, obviously. It was late in the evening. Jesus said, now, fellas, get in the boat and go across the sea and I'll meet you over there. And I think they said, no, Jesus, we don't want to do that. Uh, that would be dangerous. So obviously Jesus had to constrain them. He had to, had to force them almost to get in the boat and cross the sea. Now, do we believe that Jesus knew there'd be a storm that night? Obviously. He's omniscient, as you know. He knows everything, everything that has happened, everything that will. And he knew full well that there would be a storm that night. So he, he deliberately sent those men into that storm. Now, there are so many classic illustrations of God sending His choicest servants into hard, difficult situations. Those men went through something that night that I believe they never forgot. They went through an extremely dangerous and trying situation. Do you believe that God will do that to His choicest servants? You see, I talk to people and have through the years and many times when things begin to go wrong or they begin to have uh, difficult circumstances, uh, the first thing they say, I, I wonder why God would allow this. Well, did God allow it? Yes or no? Is God sovereign? The word sovereign means that He is in absolute control of His universe. Jesus said a little bird, a little sparrow, cannot fall to the ground unless God permits it. So obviously, God permitted these things to happen to, uh, to these disciples. He sent them into that storm, and He permits these things to happen to some of His choicest servants. And dear one, He might permit something like that to happen to one of us. And there's always a reason for it. It isn't necessarily because He's mad at us. It isn't because we've uh, committed sin. Now, if things begin to go wrong in our lives, difficulties, financial setbacks, and illnesses, that sort of thing. Uh, it's a good idea to examine our lives, sure. ask God, Lord, is there something wrong in my life for which you are chastening me? And do you believe that God will show us what it is if there's something that needs to be corrected? Obviously. And if He doesn't show us something wrong, then it could be He's trying to teach us a spiritual lesson that we would not learn any other way. Have you ever noticed, and I'm sure most of you have, those spiritual lessons we learn in difficult circumstances, they are the ones that stay with us and impress us, right? As long as everything's going well and the family's well and there's a little money in the bank and we have a job uh, and uh, we see somebody else go through a difficult time, God brings them through it and blesses them, and uh, we say, yeah, that's nice, but it really doesn't too much impress us, does it? But when we go through it, a hard circumstance, and if you've been saved very long, you have, because God will see to it, we will never grow, 
we will never develop and mature to stable, mature Christians without some difficulties. Amen. Do you agree with that? Amen. It just does not work any other way. So, there are so many illustrations that we could talk about where God sent His choicest servants into a difficult situation. I think without a doubt, the most typical one would be, uh, be Job. Do all of you remember the story of Job? Don't turn to it. I think Job is a classic illustration. You remember? Job was one of the most wealthy, powerful men in the Middle Eastern world of that day. He was wealthy. He had a family. He had sons and, da and daughters. He was highly respected. The Bible says he was a good man. He loved God. He served God. He eschewed. He avoided evil. And yet, all of those things that happened to him. He lost his family. He lost his wealth. All of his cattle were gone. He lost his health. Finally wound up from the most powerful man in the Middle East sitting out there on that ice pile, scratching himself with a, bro a piece of broken pottery. You, you can't imagine a greater change than that. Right. Now, there was a spiritual lesson. I know there, there are a number of reasons why I believe that God allowed that. And incidentally, you do remember that God had to allow that. Right. Everything that Satan did to him, he had to run to God and get permission. That's right. Isn't that a comfort? Dear one, nothing touches us. There is not a thing can touch my life or yours that God doesn't permit. Amen. And if he permits it, it's for our good and his glory. Amen. Now, the man Job, there was a spiritual lesson that that man needed to learn. As great as he was, he never lost his faith. He never lost his integrity. But he did come to the place that his wife said, uh, why don't you just curse God and die? Pitiful. Now, the thing that he needed to learn was that God is a righteous God. Amen. That is so important, dear one, to understand that. And especially in the day in which we live today, with all that's going on, the, the suffering and the wickedness and warfare and killing and terrorism. You see, we must understand if God allows this kind of thing to go on, and He does, then we must understand that He is righteous when He does that. Amen. The Bible says He is a righteous God. He always does what's right. That's right. Now, in the matter of Job, uh, in Job chapter 23, let me just read this. Here's what Job said after he had lost everything. Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find uh, Him, that is God that I might come even to his seat or his throne. I would order my cause, my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. Now, how does that sound? I would order my cause before him. If I just knew where I could come into the personal presence of God and fill my mouth with arguments and present him my cause and what's happening to me, I believe God would see that what he's doing is not right. Now, you talk about presumption. Listen again. I would know the words which he would answer me <clears throat> and understand what he would say unto me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him. So should I be delivered forever from my judge. If I just knew where to, to find God personally, tell him what's going on here and what he's doing, he would see my side of it and, and he'd uh, relieve me of this. Now, dear one, that is pure presumption. In fact, that borders on blasphemy. You see, uh, we don't question God. God is righteous. God is holy. God is, uh, is a, a sovereign creator and we don't question him. Now, in, verse, in chapter 38 of the book of Job, and I'll not read just a verse or two here. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Have you ever been around a person who was trying to discuss and talk about something that he didn't know a thing about? Now, no knowledge, but he's trying to talk about it. That's what Job was doing. Now, God said, Gird up now thy loins like a man. I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. 
Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Job, when I created this universe and the earth and, uh, and, and established the foundations, as he said, who hath laid the measure of, the, of uh, thereof, uh, if thou knowest? Who has stretched the line upon it? And he goes on now in chapters 38 and 39. He asked Job a whole string of scientific questions. A lot of them that uh, some of the scientists didn't catch up with for years. Now, I'm going to turn on over to Job chapter 42. And let's see what Job now says. In Job chapter 42, and uh, I'll begin reading with verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Remember, that's what God asked Job. Now Job answers, Therefore have I uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, declare thou unto me. Again, that's God speaking. I have heard, now here's, here's Job's conclusion. I have heard of, of, of thee by thy hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in sackcloth and ashes. He learned the lesson, didn't he? See, I believe that that was the primary reason that God allowed all of those things to happen to Job. I know it set an example for us to comfort us, but I think that he needed to learn that lesson. That's the reason that Jesus sent those men into that storm that night. They didn't get it by feeding the 15,000, but he sent them into a storm so they would learn it. Now, let's hasten on. The first lesson we can learn from that is that Jesus may send us into a storm. The second lesson is Jesus saw them while they were in that storm. Amen. Jesus saw them. Look at your Bible again now, and let's read, if we may, verses 46 through 48. And when he had sent them away, that is the multitude, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary. Do you think Jesus knew what was going on down there in the Sea of Galilee? Uh, when we were in Israel back in the 70s, a group of us from Temple went to the Holy Land, and a wonderful, wonderful experience. The road from Jerusalem that goes north, going up toward the Sea of Galilee, you go up over a mountain, and suddenly the whole Jordan Valley spreads out in front of you. Here's the Jordan, the Sea of Galilee. The Jordan River comes in from the north, and it empties out down here at the south. Beautiful, beautiful place. And uh, the mountain on the northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee, there's a, a large mountain as high as uh, Lookout Mountain. In fact, it, it rather reminded me of it. When we were crossing the Sea of Galilee, going from uh, oh, the, the lower side up to... Uh, the northern shore where this took place, I looked up there and there was that mountain that came out almost close to the Sea of Galilee. And I couldn't help but think of this passage. I wonder if that isn't where Jesus sat that night with a full view of the Sea of Galilee and watched those fellows down there rowing and toiling. And the Bible says he went up into a mountain to do what? To pray. Can you... Uh, Imagine whom he was praying for at that time. Can't you just picture him sitting up there on that mountain watching those men down there in the storm and the waves and they were rowing and struggling and Jesus praying for them. Amen. When we get into a storm that he may send us into, what do you think Jesus is doing? Oh, the Bible has so many promises. Again, let me read just two or three. I think it would be well just to listen to them. In John 17 and verse 20. You remember this is Jesus' great high priestly prayer, and here's what he said. He said, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Would that include us? Did you believe on the Lord Jesus through reading the accounts of these men, the gospel messages? <clears throat> so Jesus said, I don't pray just for these men. I pray for all those who will believe, and that includes me. Notice again, if you would, in, in Romans 8 and verse 34. 
Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Amen. Those verses on the, the high priestly ministry and the intercessory ministry of Christ. One of my very favorites is Hebrews chapter 7. Let me read that one. Hebrews chapter 7 <clears throat> and uh, beginning with verse uh, 24. Here's what the Bible says. Wherefore, he, Jesus, is able also to save them to the uttermost, literally all the way to the end. Amen. His great high priestly ministry, his intercessory prayer, guarantees our security. The song, what his brother mentioned a while ago, eternal security. What a, what a blessing it is to know that. Amen. I was raised in another denomination. I wasn't saved, but I went to church some, and I heard those preachers preach, and uh, they told me that I could be saved, and then if I sinned, I lost it. Then I could get saved again. Then if I sinned, I'd lose it again. And obviously, I believed it. I didn't know any better. Uh, they were the preacher, and I figured they knew what they were talking about. And I believed that. I got saved. I still believed it. Now, I've had people ask me, do you think a person can really be born again and not believe in eternal security? <clears throat> And my answer is absolutely, because I did. <laughs> See, I was ignorant of the Bible, knew practically nothing about it, and I was simply depending on what I'd heard those preachers preach. And then later, when I really began to study the Bible, <clears throat> I found out that uh, that doesn't what the Bible teaches. Jesus, seated at the right hand of God, pleading our case. He's our lawyer. The, the word that's used of him, our advocate, that's the word, that's a Greek word, lawyer. It's the same word that was used of the lawyers in those Greek courts. And he pleads our case. Every time Satan accuses us of something, Jesus intercedes and he prays for us. Do you think Jesus ever loses a case? Do you think, do you think God would not hear his prayer? See, that, that's uh, one of the many things that guarantees our eternal security. So as these men were out there in the midst of that storm, and they were rowing and toiling and struggling, and Jesus sat up there and watched them. They were just as safe as if they'd been sitting at home in their uh, big uh, recliners, right? So he, uh, Jesus saw them. He understood what was going on. He knew exactly what they needed, and he prayed for them. He interceded for them, and there was no possibility that anything could happen to them. Now, Jesus saw them. He prayed for them. He sent them, and one more thing. He, when, uh, when the time came, He saved them out of the storm. Amen. Have you ever gone through a serious problem in your Christian life? I mean something that was difficult, something that you really wondered about. And you, you were faithful, you trusted God, and the time came, maybe you learned the spiritual lesson that God was trying to teach you and me, and then the clouds broke, and God brought us out of it, and the sun shone again. Amen. Now, look at your Bible. Back in Mark, in, uh, let's read verses beginning with verse uh, 48, the last statement in verse 48. And uh, it says, For the wind was contrary unto them, and about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. Now, let's uh, stop there a minute. The fourth watch of the night. Do you know when that was? The Roman night, the guards, divided into four different sections of the, the night. One guard would come on at six to nine. Nine to twelve, twelve to three, and three to six. So when Jesus came to those men, it was between three and six o'clock the next morning. Now, uh, here again. Why do you think that he let them toil and struggle and roll out there almost all night long before he came to them? Well, I can just imagine, now the Bible doesn't say this, but I can just imagine that it took that long to break their will and their stubbornness. You see, as long as we feel like we can work it out, do we not try to do it? 
uh, there's just something about us, you know, a little bit of pride. And I know this is a tough situation, but uh, I've been in it before, and I think I can work it out, and we'll do everything we can. What do you think those fellows were thinking about uh, 4 or 5 o'clock the next morning? Incidentally, have you ever figured out where they were? John's Gospel said they had rowed about 25 or 30 furlongs. Now, that would be about three and a half miles. The Sea of Galilee, it's basically a roughly heart-shaped. The wide place in the north, and that's where they were crossing up, the widest place, and it's uh, seven miles wide at the north part. It's 13 miles long. Now, if they had rowed three and a half miles, and they were up at the widest part, seven miles wide, and they had rowed three and a half, where were they at five o'clock the next morning? <laughs> right in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And I believe that those fellows had come to the place that they, they uh, thought they were not going to get out of at that time. They obviously had been in storms before. They had worked their way out of it. As far as I know, Jesus had never delivered them a storm before. And here they were in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. They were exhausted, I'm sure, toiling on those, ro on those oars all night. They were, they were exhausted, and they knew that they were going to go down. And I think Simon Peter wasn't quite so confident about that time. Uh, can't you just see Simon taking charge of that thing early in the night? Uh, here's Simon. He always took the lead. He was the spokesman, and he was giving directions. Now, John, you fellas get on those oars, and you know how to handle them. By the, about 5 o'clock the next morning, he said, boys, we're going to go down this time. <laughs> you see, it took them that long, I believe, to break their will and force them to the place that they had to admit they couldn't do it. And God has to sometimes put us in that same place. Then, notice what it says. In verse 50, For they all saw him, uh, but uh, verse 49, But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and screamed out, literally. <laughs> it just about frightened them out of their wits. Uh, here they were, thinking they were ready to die, exhausted, no doubt wet, cold, and they saw this apparition coming across the sea. <laughs> I think that would kind of get your attention. And they, they thought, oh, what in the world? They saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. He went up unto them in the ship, and the wind ceased. Incidentally, this is the time that Peter walked on the water. Matthew's account, Matthew 14, uh, you remember, Peter said, Lord, if that's really you, bid me come to you on the water. Jesus said, all right, Peter, come on. Now, that was Peter's authority to walk on the water. Has he ever told you to walk on the water? If he hasn't, don't try it because you'll drown. See, God, God gave uh, Peter, Jesus gave Peter the authority to walk on the water. And he was doing fine until he got his eyes off of Jesus and looked at the wave. And you've heard that many times before. So when the time was right, when these men learned the lesson they should have learned through the feeding of the 15,000, when they understood that, that Jesus would really take care of them, that he was sufficient for every situation, then Jesus came to them and delivered them out of that situation. Several years ago, I ran across a little poem that I think expresses what we've said tonight. Let me share it with you and we'll be through. It's entitled, They Shall Never Overflow. Has a sorrow come upon you that no other soul can share? Does the burden seem too heavy for your aching heart to bear? There is one whose love and comfort will go with you down life's road. There's a burden bearer ready. Uh, there's a burden bearer ready if you'll trust him with your load. Lo, the precious promise reaches to the depth of human woe that however deep the waters, they shall never overflow. Do you ever grow discouraged as you journey on your way? Does there seem to be more darkness than there is of sunny day? Ah, it is hard to learn the lesson as you pass beneath the rod, that the shadow and the sunshine are alike the will of God. Let me speak a word of promise like the promise in the bowl, the rainbow, that however 
deep the waters, they shall never overflow. Amen. They'll never let you down. Jesus will never let you uh, go so far that he won't bring you out of it, just like he did these men when we learn these lessons. Do you think that we need to learn those three spiritual lessons? Jesus may send us into a difficult situation, and he may do that in order to teach us a spiritual lesson. All things work together for good to them that love God. He may send us into a storm, but when he does, he sees every move that we make. Amen. And he prays for us and intercedes for us. When the time is right and we learn what he wants us to learn, then just like Jesus reached down and picked up Peter out of the water, he'll pick us up, the clouds will break, and we'll go on our way rejoicing. Let's learn those lessons from what happened to these men that night. Let's pray together. Father, thank you again for the opportunity that we had to open your precious word. Thank you for the experience that you recorded in your word that happened to those apostles that night. And I truly believe that they never forgot the lesson they learned that night on the Sea of Galilee. And I pray that you'll help us to understand if we have these difficult times, heartaches, setbacks, that it may be that you have uh, deliberately allowed these things to happen in order that we might uh, learn to trust you and trust you completely. Speak to our hearts. Dear Lord, even though we've been talking to believers tonight, if there's one here who does not know Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, if he's never understood his need, if he's never received Christ and his death on the cross to pay for his sin, I pray that a seed has been planted tonight and that seed will grow, and that person will come to the place where he'll receive Christ as his Savior. Bless us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.